So I think it's highly appropriate that we started day two by talking about the future of storytelling with Astrid uh, and talking about how AR and VR is a new medium uh, and changing the way that we see the world. And there's no better person to talk to about how we see the world than uh, a bunch of amazing immersive artists. And that's what we put together today to end your day looking at AR and VR art uh, and the tools that these artists are, are, are using to create uh, new experiences and how in turn uh, their work is actually shaping the AR VR industry as a whole. And as um, art is something that you need to experience, I thought that the first thing that we should do as a collective here on stage is to have each of these artists introduce themselves and then also um, uh, either tell you or show you some of their work behind us here on the screen. So I'm going to start first with Sutu. Okay. Do you want the video on now? Uh, well, I'll just say hello first. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Sutu. Um, I'm from <laughs> Australia, uh, running a company called iJack, and we're making augmented reality art uh, products like books and posters and uh, huge prints for event-based AR experiences, and we're working with a network of artists from around the world to do that. And I'm also very into the virtual reality art, and uh, I started um, doing tilt brush painting and gravity sketch paintings and things like this. And that's kind of landed me in this interesting new position of like uh, doing uh, concept art for Hollywood films and things like that in VR, uh, which is probably like the beginning of a new era for, for, the, for the making art in that way, I guess. And, um, and yeah, I will show you a little reel of uh, sort of some things that I've been working on. Oh, that's awesome. Let's go back to the last slide and play the video. <laughs> Sorry. Do you actually have a mic? Do I have to press the No, it's good. Okay. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> Julian. Boom. Hey, cool people. <laughs> hey, so yeah, so I'm Julian Staden. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm director, founder director of the Mixed and Augmented Reality Art Organization, marart.org. Um, I'm also an academic. I lecture at, um, I'm head of innovative media at London College of Fashion in University of Arts London. I also work at the Fachhochschule Salzburg and the University of Hertfordshire, um, lecturing in interactive media and mixed reality. Um, yeah, what else? So I'm, um, I've been doing AR art for ages. I've been doing this since 2003, um, since the AR toolkit days, back when you had to program things in C++. Hmm. Um, yeah, and so basically my, my trajectory is going through art school into digital media arts, into interactive media. Um, around 2009, um, Chris Stapleton, who some of you might know, started the Arts and Humanities track in a conference called ISMA, which um, since 2010 onwards I've been involved with organising exhibitions and uh, panels and symposiums on. And most recently, I've, I've been shifting into, I've started an initiative called Digital Ping Pong, which is within um, exploring ways within the fashion industry that we can use mixed and augmented reality to um, 
enhance not just the experience of, of media communications, but also all facets of industry from production to manufacturer, et cetera. Uh, and that's under a framework of sustainability. That's enough for me. <laughs> Great. Oh, you, you don't have an art show picture? No, it's just a picture. Right. I'm easy. <laughs> one slide. Just one slide. You'll have to go talk to him after. Yeah. <laughs> Amir, you're next up. All right. Hi, Amir Baradron. I'm the uh, Creative Research Associate at Columbia University. Um, a little bit like my colleague here, I remember um, Arnie, for those of you who remember, before Augmented World Expo, it used to be just a meetup group in New York. So I remember AR from those days. <laughs> and I also remember going to even gaming conferences when you would say AR, and they're like, AR what? <laughs> um, so those are good, good old days. Anyway, um, uh, what I'm very much interested in is to think about the role of the artist, the role of the audience, and the way in which we need to train and retrain, perhaps, how we understand our sense of self as we do these things. Um, a particular concept I'm working with is called um, co-creativity. So when uh, you have all these um, kind of technologies that allow, for example, AI that allows for uh, characters to be fully enabled and be smart and intelligent and provide what I call spherical narrative generation, meaning that the audience becomes part of the narrative, they can, they can maneuver through that, they can um, navigate through that space, um, then the big question is, what's authorship altogether? What's the role of the artist altogether? Do we even need to exist in that space? So I want to just end with a little video. Um, I was going to show you all kinds of crazy things I'm doing, <coughs> with rethinking storytelling and, and um, uh, characters that are AI enabled and all of that, but I thought, I should show you something from a little bit uh, before 2011, Ismar, that uh, Chris and, um, and multiple other people actually were involved, in, including you. Um, uh, they, they had a call for artists saying, what's the future of AR? So I proposed this. Um, I said, future of AR is simple as drinking water. Is there sound? Sure. Please. So to, to my greatest surprise, they gave me the first prize there. And there was no AR there, right? So um, basically, what, what I try to do is really to think about AR and AI in a much more conceptual way. And that's the addition that artists can, can provide to, to this field in a way. And just to give you a little last thing. So I, I think uh, a lot of the things as creative researcher I do is to come up with vocabulary that then helps um, me throw these vocabularies back to the academia, back to the thinkers, back to the philosophers, and asking them to kind of work within that framework and do this kind of ping pong that you were talking about, or tennis, you know, going back and forth to, to understand better this field uh, conceptually. So that's it. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay, Luciano. Thanks very much. I'm uh, Luciano Pina. I'm a conceptual artist and augmented reality developer. And uh, like my uh, colleagues, I have been working with AR for eight years already. When Metayo was still, still a German company uh, creating uh, technology. And actually, um, I wondered why are we then all these years working still in this field? I'm actually uh, curious. Yeah? It's strange that we are so busy still working for several years with it. And um, uh, I think here you can really see that, that uh, augmented reality is maybe finally getting out of the curve, and finally getting into big mainstream. And um, I want to show one project that I've been working on, and is a project of uh, Matti Schnitzke, and he's a composer. 
and uh, he created an AR techno opera. And it's a project that I am doing together with Klausine van der Zandschuld, who is sitting here right in front. And she's actually the reason that I'm here, so uh, thanks, Klausine, for that. And um, Mathis, uh, he was invited to uh, a space called um, in Obing, which is a, a place very near M Munich. And there is this uh, heating plant, a former heating plant. And it's just a beautiful space, and immediately got the idea to create an opera uh, out of that. And he, he met Wazin, so we started developing a concept. Now I'm going to show you uh, a clip of one minute, and this is uh, made uh, actually this morning with our smartphones, so bear with me if it is not uh, professional quality. That will be created and that will be posted online uh, later. So here goes. Lateinisch Corpus, biologisch gesehen das materielle Erscheinungsbild eines Lebewesens, das den Menschen oder das Tier von seiner Umgebung unterscheidet, egal ob tot oder lebendig. Der Aufbau des Körpers ist eine Disziplin der Anatomie, die der Körperfunktionen und der im Körper ablaufenden Stoffwechselprozesse eine der Physiologie. Now, uh, I am biased because uh, I worked on the project, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's really something uh, to experience. Now, we are fully booked this evening, 340 people. Uh, tomorrow, we are almost fully booked, but Sunday, there is still some room. This, if you want to come, then come Sunday. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, Evelyn. Right. Hello, my name is Evelyn. I'm combining uh, art, games, and new technologies now since well, 10, 15 years. Um, and uh, I studied architecture, set and costume design, and started to work interdisciplinary in my studies and start to direct. And I was always interested how we can combine the real, the analog world with the virtual digital one. This is how I came into the new, into the new technologies. Um, I know Julian because I was the program chair Europe from the ISMAR in these days. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, I think we have a lot of um, things to discuss. Um, one thing I have to say, you can't explain the matrix, you have to experience the matrix. So I won't lose words about my work. I will show you something, um, uh, two trailers, one of my past project and one of the current one, which you can experience now in Munich. We, we launched it uh, last week. And, um, but the first one, I have to say, I'm sorry for that, it's without sound. So this is Orpheus, um, I made here in Munich 2012. Um, it was a thousand square meter installation in an underground bunker. Everything that you have seen, we built into this bunker. So this was an em empty space and all this world you have seen, we created and built into it. It worked uh, in that way that uh, the people buy slots. So um, it's a single player experience. 
they got their toolkits on site. In that case, it was a smartphone and uh, headphones. We created an app for this, an augmented reality app, because it was nothing on the market which worked in that way that how I wanted to work with it. So we started with that 2008 and we launched it 2012. And it was my step into the games industries. Um, I'm coming normally from opera, so, um, <laughs> and I wanted to um, invent the opera stuff and to bring new audiences together. But uh, somehow I invented the games in a new way, so um, I was the last years in the games and I worked for Bioshock uh, Infinite and Resident Evil 6. So I'm creating also mixed reality experiences for companies and so on. And um, now I'm back with a new project, Euridica, um, which, you which you can experience now here in Munich. So we launched it last week. I have to tell you, we are sold out in a moment. <laughs> so. <laughs> If anybody is really interested in here, please um, grab me. Perhaps I can do something for you. Otherwise, um, please uh, go onto the website because uh, there will be a second period. We will play it here. It's location-based and an old fire station. <laughs> we are working with virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D sound. Um, it's a mystery, so you have to create your own experience. And this is the trailer. Oh, it's also without music, that's a pity. Can you turn the sound on? It doesn't matter, it's okay. So it's, it's a pity because I'm working with a very great uh, composer, a Danish one, so Skunvel Rieberg, she is the composer of games like Fuf and Inside, so this is the follow-up from uh, Limbo. And she made a really, really great uh, binaural sound composition, uh, which is steric, and you can move into the composition, and the composition is moving around you. Um, you have to play it. It's really interesting what she has done for us. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. OK, so uh, uh, let's just jump right into it, because I want to make sure we have a good conversation here, because it is a panel, so we're supposed <laughs> to be talking to each other. <laughs> Uh, the, I think the, the best question to start with is, how is AR and VR changing the art world? Let's just cut to the chase. I think the notion of co-creativity is very important. I think um, understanding spherical narrative making, meaning that when you throw the audience into that space, when they become part of the narrative that's being produced, um, what becomes the role of the artist in, in that space? And if you look at the art market, um, Art market has had a, always a difficult time adjusting to technology altogether, right? So if you look at photography, for example, it took almost 100 years till 1920s till they said, oh my God, photographers are not technicians who just you know, click a button. They are actually uh, artists who make creative decisions in terms of framing, framing what is it being printed on, um, what, what's the story that's being told, what's in it, what's not. And, same kind of things have been happening with video art and now with AR and VR, is, is that the art market is having a hard time, one, uh, creating editions of the work, meaning how do you sell the work, right? So how do you turn this, these artworks that the, uh, these colleagues are doing into collectible pieces? And the other thing is who, who is behind it and is it even worthy of being considered as art if there's a lot of technology involved in it? So those are main questions right now, I think. Yeah. I think it's also, I mean, you know, within art, we always have to also kind of look at points of reference and precursors. And um, it's, I mean, in terms of, I'm not necessarily answering that question about, you know, how it's affecting the art industry, but I think um, it's reinforcing a kind of a, a need for recognition of like precursors. So, for example, I, I, um, I teach prehistories of mixed reality. And, um, you know, I'm talking about things like rotoscoping like these really old analog techniques of doing this, you know, this notion of augmentation rather than this kind of tech paradigm of like AR, VR, 360 video. And um, I think that it, it, it reinforces the challenge within art to be kind of transdisciplinary. And um, that's a really important kind of emergent thing over the last definitely, definitely 10, 20 years, you know, is like, tech working with art and art working with science and it's gone to the, I, I, well, I mean, this is, I don't know what you guys think, but I think gone are the days where you sit in the studio all by yourself all the time. It's much more collaborative, it's much more transdisciplinary and 
Um, this is another example of that in a long line of examples. I I mean, in, in the end, you, as an artist, you just want to tell a story you know, whatever, with whatever means. Yeah? Mm. And um, so, for instance, <coughs> when I look at Maya and um, Matas, he, he just had this vision to uh, transform, transform this space, and then augmented reality was just a natural tool to use. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, and of course, technology can, can, can help you uh, come up with ideas. But in the end, I think it's a story that, that you want to tell, or the, the feeling, or the experience that you want to cre create that, that, um, that gives you the, the tools, uh, not the other way around. At least that would, that would be my approach to it. Well, with our, uh, our project, we had uh, 50 artists involved in the book, and every artist uh, brief was to think about the printed image and then think about the image that's going to be laid over the top and what kind of value it adds to that. And we started to see a lot of interesting, innovative uh, emergence where they're adding narrative to it. We had one where it showed some um, African-American slaves being auctioned off 100 years ago. And then when you look at it through the AR, you suddenly see that they're in the orange jumpsuits and it's quickly showing that this is the modern day slave of these African-American people being put in prison. So in just like an instance, they could see this uh, shift of time take place on the, on the page. And then in a comic we've been exploring, the comic is showing a man just uh, throughout the story, but that man is going through like a gender fluidity uh, sort of process. And so when you look at it through the AR, you're seeing that, uh, that internal process and you're seeing their gender change and things like that. And you could, you could change race and you can start to explore all of those kind of motifs. And just from the point of view of the book, uh, for us, like the, the trailer for the book was viewed like 10 million times and that generated thousands of sales. And then it became a, you know, an income for artists, which is important, especially for animators trying to sell digital works, which is a really big challenge. But suddenly when it's linked to a physical product, they were able to uh, show both their physical work and the, the digital work and make some money off it, which course is super important for all the artists that we're representing so and so uh, I guess a question follow-up question is is do you see AR and VR as a medium or as a tool or does it not matter I mean how do you define tool and medium so separately well you know I guess like paper is a medium paintbrush is is the tool you know what I mean so are you, are you do you see this as a new form of uh, like a new canvas um, or, or as uh, Luciano pointed out, he uses it as a tool uh, within, within his art. Um, I'm just curious. Well, you can definitely access another point of view. So in that sense, you're, it's a tool. Uh, like those points of views before in some of the early examples where you're going along uh, some sort of down the street and then you look at it, that same street through AI, you're seeing it maybe 100 years earlier or something like that. And that's an educational tool in that sense. Uh, but for the artist, uh, you know, it can be another layer of expression and then that becomes another medium to explore. For me personally, I love this, uh, this thinking process, what I'm gonna add to it, or how I'm gonna exploit AR to, to bring a new sort of point of view to my artwork that I couldn't capture just with the still image or something. I would like to add something. I think form follows function. So I'm doing a lot of consulting in the different areas, and it's not always the best way to use new tech. Because it's all about content, yeah, so, and it's about storytelling and what, what is the idea about or what should it do with the people or who are the audiences and I really tell the people, please don't do it, yeah? So if you don't have the right people, if you don't have the right idea and if you don't have the right budget, please don't do it, yeah? Do something else, yeah? But if you do, do it in a great way, so this is the only chance. Right. And so let's pick up on a little bit on storytelling because Astrid kicked off this morning saying um, that time-based linear storytelling is changing to more spatial and, and um, uncontrolled. So um, how does AR and VR change the way that you're telling stories? I think the way, I, so, so this is how you conceptualize AR. I see AR as part of an overarching concept of AI, right? So there's nothing unfamiliar about AR other than the fact that it's computer vision, other than the fact that it's machine learning. 
So um, I, I think understanding it in that perspective gives us as artists better tools and better conceptual um, vocabularies to be able to navigate through that space. Um, but uh, just to say how possibly it can um, change how we do art. For example, right now I'm, I'm doing three projects. One is uh, for the 150th anniversary of Canada was chosen to represent uh, the, the, the country's um, inauguration, if you want. And I'm working another one with the Knight Foundation on storytelling and a third one, which is for Sundance right now, which, by the way, I need producers. So if you're interested in being part of these things, <laughs> I can't do it alone in my lab. I need some help. Um, but uh, in, in terms of storytelling, so when you add AI, then you're like, OK, so what happens to the characters when they're enabled with AI? And that's when it becomes spherical. That's when it becomes, and when I say spherical, it means that the audience that goes in has truly a time-based maneuvering space as well as spatial maneuvering. So it can go any direction. So we would have, you know, the kind of project I'm working on is that the audience can come see this story and then say, I'm not interested in what you guys are saying. And we'll move out and, and go to another story. So, but for this really to happen or for me to say, I see that you're leaving as a character, right? To say, I see that you're leaving. I see that you're perplexed. I see that your facial expressions are, are, are showing that you're perplexed. Can I help you? Can I explain to you what, what it is? So that's when really we are pushing the boundaries of storytelling is when we enable our characters with AI and let them then engage in this full um, spherical manner. Luciano, maybe you can talk a little bit about your opera in that way because usually when you go to an opera, you have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. You sit down and you watch it. Yes. Um, how, how, um, how has that changed um, with the current project that you've worked on? Um, well, the, the opera still has a beginning and a middle and an end, I okay. would say. <laughs> uh, but there are no chairs, so the whole space is used. And um, to uh, maybe uh, come back to your point is that uh, the AR is really used to, to reveal part of the story in a, in a non-linear way and it's up to you to discover the story or to do something with it or not. And um, it really reinforces uh, the, the feeling because the story is a science fiction type of story. Uh, it uh, happens in the future and then actually from the future we look back to a near future. So you walk around as if in a museum in the future and uh, you look at this place using your mobile phone and it reveals part of something that happened. Uh, and, and it really reinforces the sense that something really happened there. And I think, uh, I mean, I've, you know, as an artist, you're always as great as your last work. Eh? But uh, in this case, I really felt that uh, when we were working on it and we saw the first, even the simple concepts, that I really, and I saw it in this place, I really made sense that, okay, that's actually the great, uh, that is the tool that we need to use. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, you, you are in your, in your studio, you're thinking up all these ideas, and then uh, you know, half of them, they, they um, <laughs> mind up, uh, uh, won't work. Uh, but with this also, we were in the, in, in the, the heating plant, and then we did some uh, little tests, and then we really felt, okay, this is great. This is what we should do. And, and Sutu, I'm curious because you have your book, which is um, a little bit more controlled, right? Because you have uh, a 2D <coughs> picture, and I'm only able to look at that picture one way. Yes, it does come alive with AR, but you also work on virtual worlds, which are 360 degrees. So, um, how, as an artist, how do you how do you feel about, um, you know, I guess uh, providing uh, an, an artwork where you really can't control the perspective that the, the audience is going to take. You know, they may just turn your back on all the work that you put in and, and stare at this one little piece behind, behind them that you never thought they would be doing. Um, yeah, I think, like, firstly, I just love um, creating the VR art. It's the first time in history that I could stand inside my artwork and see it from all these different angles. And I, I paint a, a brush stroke, and then I walk around it and see it from this other side, and that makes my brain come to life and I think, well, now I have to draw this part and this part and this part. And being immersed in that world, I suddenly start to access it from all those different angles. 
And then I really have to imagine myself like, well, that person then stepping into my art. And I'm going, well, they're going to stand here and they're going to look around and they're going to see that thing and that thing. And then what I've started to do lately is create these interactive narrative VR experiences. And you're constantly thinking about presence and how to uh, bring their attention to an area of the painting. So maybe it illuminates over here and the rest of it goes dark and that's the easiest way to get their attention over here. Or maybe a little bird flies past and it lands on the rock over there and you follow the bird over there. Or maybe you just hear the sound of something behind you and then that makes you look behind you. So there's, there's kind of tools like that we're using to kind of get people's attention. That's, that's probably... Uh, the, the ju juxt of it, and we'll keep in inventing new ways to, to, do, to do that, for, for sure. Okay, and uh, let's talk a little bit about tools, because we have in the audience, I assume, folks that are creating technological solutions, maybe they're um, OEMs that are creating smart glasses, or even the phones themselves, and you're utilizing all this as part of your storytelling. So I guess, um, what would you want to say to these folks? Like, what are things that are missing? What are things that are working right? Um, what advice would you give them if you had their ear in providing you and equipping you with what you would need to really unlock your imagination and your creative power? I've, I've got a good point on that, actually. I, like, we, I mean, with education and, and art, they're, you know, they're, they're the same, but they're also very different. And um, the, the thing I've noticed is, you know, you have these two options. You have really low end, you have really high end. And the, well, there's a mid range, of course, but like, um, the difficulty is when you're talking about these higher end projects, like everyone said, you know, these really, you know, kind of amazing experiences that use really good technology um, and do, as this thing says, push technical boundaries. Um, <laughs> that's great, but there's this real disparity between showing that to an undergraduate art student and them feeling confident and safe in being able to do that. So. I think there's a really important kind of, um, there's, this is, it's a really important point for tech to understand is that like, um, there needs to be a real good, you know, because if you're doing a really high-end artwork, there's a million really shitty artworks to match that one really good one, right? So there needs to be kind of like some lower-end products. And um, I mean, another thing is, there was a question about platforms. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead yeah, to them. But, okay. um, 10 years ago, people used to ask, what, what do artists need in, in AR software? And we used to say, uh, a graphic user interface, not heavy, heavy C++ programming. There were lots of frameworks, there were lots of wrappers, like uh, Python, Java, da, 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 written for it. Uh, then we got a lot of these graphic user interfaces, and then it was like, again, then it was like completely removed the programming, and then now you see node-based systems, which for artists, I, I mean, I find they're quite popular. I don't have a, I sit both sides of the fence because I, I use both myself, but um, I think a range of options is the most important thing. Don't try to copy, there's a lot of, I see a lot of things that are exactly the same. It's like, well, don't just do a better version of someone else's thing, do something that's. And I, think, and I think what's really exciting as well is really to think about the idea that the fragility of the technology that we're mm. experiencing right now can be part of the creative process itself. When it's clunky, you can use, as an artist, you can use the clunkiness of it. Exactly. You can yeah. use the glitch as an art form itself. So that's when you can truly, um, you know, to answer your earlier question, when sometimes the medium is the message or the message is the medium too, creating art for, for form for, for form's sake is also powerful in some ways, where you're exploring the limitations of the technology. You bring it to its edge when it literally shakes. You bring it to its edge when it literally glitches. And you say, what's the feeling in that space? And that's what you explore. These are the kind of spaces I've been interested in exploring. So for, for those folks who are doing hardware and software, yeah, obviously, you know, uh, funding is a big thing. If, if you guys want to fund us, you know, <laughs> Go, come along, <laughs> but but I think maybe you know I'm thinking about Metayo. I used to do research and development for them uh, with my artwork, and they were like taking care of a lot of the uh, art that I used to do. And really, in that process of back and forth, when I was pushing it for them to to use it in a particular way, they were like, "Oh my God, we didn't think about this particular functionality." And it was in that space where they could push their own um, kind of technological advancement too. But I think going to the edges is always uh, an ex interesting space to be in. Can I just so add I, one I, thing? Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I was, I was just going to add that I, with Tilt Brush, for example, like I will put a put, uh, 65-year-old lady, put the headset on her, and explain in under two minutes how to use the interface. Here is your palette. Here is how you select the tool. Pull the trigger and start painting. And suddenly, a 65-year-old lady with no computer experience is painting a 3D environment. So the best thing that any uh, developer can do, if you can make your uh, interface so intuitive that an old person can get in, I'm not that old, obviously, but uh, the, <laughs> she's not that old, I meant to say, um, could get in there and just start painting away, like, that's amazing. And I did the same thing with, like, a five-year-old kid. I put it on him. Here's, how, here's the paint palette. Here's your tools. Get going. And then that, both of those people, in both instances, I wanted to say, oh, you can also do that. And they said, no, 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 I'm busy. <laughs> and then they just kept painting. So that, for me as well, I never used 3D programs so much. And then suddenly, I don't like all the drop-down menus, but suddenly I'm inside my artwork, and I'm very inspired just to keep painting without any interruptions, without rendering time, just doing the work, getting in there hands-on, and, and having that sort of ability. So like that has been a huge revelation for me. Yeah, well, but this is something that has to do with interaction or experience design itself. Yeah. So also the difference is, for example, that um, this could be one difference between having a marketing event thing, demos based, yeah, because all the people are looking, oh, is this virtual reality stuff working? And where are the mistakes? And do I find a glitch and a bug and so on? Yeah. So we're watching technology, te technology totally different in an expo space. Um, but in art, you have totally different options to work with these limitations. So we do this also in our reading canal. And, it's, and what I, I can tell also to, I want to add to Sutu that um, experiences like offers or a reading are reaching an uh, audience between 16 and 85 yeah, from different backgrounds which have never experienced this before with tech stuff and, and what else. So we evaluated this also 2012, we are doing it now. So our oldest visitor now in our uh, last week was 75. <laughs> and I was really astonished how well she did. Yeah, so it's about how are you bringing things together? What is the invitation? Yeah, how is the user design made? Yeah, what, what, is this, what can it do with people? So it's all about, I think, creating emotions. So it's the combination how to bring content with emotions together to leave your scratches in the minds, in the hearts <laughs> of, of your visitors that they can take something with, yeah? And right. it can be something weird or it can be something fantastic. And that's right. just, it, I, I mean, one thing that's very exciting is the question of imaginality, right? We have Chris Stapleton, you know, whose concept of imaginality has blown me away. Is the idea that Anyway, whatever we see, augmented reality, there's nothing new about it, right? We have learned to augment our world through multiple ways. We have learned to add music for it to be a better thing. We have learned to dance to have a better life, you know, to have yes, a better life. Then experience. you can say that there's Guys, gonna, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah, but I think we should end on dance yeah. because yeah. We're, we're way far over time, but I appreciate it. Uh, I feel the, the heat from Patrice, this is why, and it gets, it's going to get tricky. Uh, and I'm sorry, Luciana, to, to interrupt no, 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 you. No but uh, please, a big round of applause for these amazing artists. And, uh, and also, I'm just going to add one thing is uh, definitely make sure that you check out their websites and, and support their work uh, and, 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 and celebrate it and spread the word. So um, we'll make sure that we put that on Twitter and our social networks. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks very much.